Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining today's webinar hosted by 3Share with our guest, The Wonderful Company. Today's webinar, 20 Sites in 12 Months, actually features 50 digital properties built with Adobe Experience Manager. We're really excited to share the story with you all. My name is Charmin Gio, and I'm Vice President of Marketing at 3Share. This webinar will be recorded, and we'll send out a recording to everyone who's registered for the event. We're happy to answer any questions you may have about the future project. Simply enter them into the questions field in the GoToWebinar module. If we don't have time to get to everyone's questions today, and the time allowed, we'll get to uh, each of you individually and make sure that you get the answers that you need. And with that, we'll get started. I'd like to uh, welcome today's presenters. We have Dennis Paulson, VP of Information Technology at Wonderful. Jason Alpal, Al <laughs> I knew I was going to butcher this, sorry for that. Apollinario, Group Director, Digital Production at Wonderful. And Paul Legan, Managing Partner at 3Share. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jason to tell us a little more about Wonderful and this project. Jason. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jason Apollinario, and don't worry, Charmin, that you're not the first person to butcher it, but it's just scarier than it looks. Um, I'm Group Director of Digital Production for Wonderful Agency, which is the full-service in-house marketing and communications agency for the wonderful company and our suite of brands. So my specific role is to oversee operations across the agency, including client services, project management, uh, as well as uh, product management and technical infrastructure. So a little bit about the wonderful company. Uh, we're a privately held company. Uh, we have a number of high quality health focused brands such as Wonderful Pistachios, Fiji Water, uh, Palm Wonderful. Uh, we're the world's largest grower of tree nuts and America's largest citrus grower. And our headquarters, uh, we're located in Los Angeles. Uh, and much of our company is in the Central Valley of California. So that's where we grow, harvest, and package our, our various products. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Wonderful Agency, it's the internal agency at the Wonderful Company. So we produce creative across all forms of media, uh, broadcast, digital, in-store, print. Um, so we handle a number of different verticals. Uh, we're highly integrated into the brand strategy and product development. So while each of the individual brands, uh, individual business units are clients, it's appropriate also, I'd say, to, to think of them as partners. And that was a key logistical piece as we embarked on implementing AEM. All right, so uh, before AEM, uh, and, and looking back at our landscape, um, the majority of our web development had been uh, pr produced through uh, third-party vendors. Uh, the individual wonderful brands, as well as the agency, uh, didn't have we didn't have internal development resources. So over the years, we had an increasing number of websites and web services. In the five years prior to AEM. We worked with over 15 different technology vendors, which uh, had a large impact to our external hard costs and also resulted in, in significant internal overhead in managing these vendors. Um, our websites were, were fragmented um, across different platforms, and in addition to the cost and timing issues I mentioned, uh, security vulnerability was also a problem and, and becoming an increasing problem. Uh, additionally, maintaining uh, creative artifacts, backups, our various files was becoming a technology and infrastructure issue as we are constantly having to upgrade server space for increasingly larger files. You know, 4K video, for example, um, as things evolved, that was just something that we were having to uh, you know, pay closer attention to. So needless to say, the goal was to consolidate to one technology uh, by re replatforming our websites. 
And so by allowing us to centralize and consolidate all of our websites in the cloud, um, that was essential to removing our web server. Uh, we never really wanted to be in the, the web hosting business per se, and so this allowed us to reduce and eventually remove all of our web servers. Next slide, please. So we needed a vendor that could knowledgeably execute the project. Uh, three Share as a trusted Adobe partner brought instant credibility. Um, additionally, they're 100% focused on AAM, uh, which gave us confidence that we'd be working with a vendor that had the utmost expertise. As I mentioned before, we didn't have um, internal develop development. Um, you know, we have obviously technology experts on our side and, and consultants, but having that actual capability was something that was really critical in, in selecting a vendor. And um, 3Share uh, has a very agile approach, which helped us to set up AEM's infrastructure to align with the way that we work internally. Yeah, hello, Dennis Paulson here. Uh, our vetting process was done by meeting and interviewing several partners. So we had a list of questions for each, and 3Share uh, was the only partner that gave us the answers we were looking for. Uh, it's also, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, they were the only a or the they were the only partner that was AEM only, which uh, helped make a decision much easier. Great, thanks, Dennis. Um, so here are some of the folks on both the wonderful agency agency team and the three shared team um, that helped make this project successful. Um, to start here on the agency side, so as I mentioned. Um, there's myself as Group Director of Digital Production. Um, the Group Director of Experiences, Andres Conde, uh, he was our um, strategic lead uh, both across uh, technology, uh, creative, and brand strategy. We had a senior digital producer who basically managed all of the day-to-day -day responsibilities from a project management and production standpoint. And then we had a dedicated QA manager who uh, reviewed all of uh, uh, the front end functionality and look and feel of all of our properties. On the three share side, um, they also had a very robust team. So um, their managing partner, Paul Legan, who's also on this webinar, um, was a key um, uh, management role for us. And also from my standpoint, as product owner of the initiative, he was sort of my key uh, person on the three share side to talk to, and that really helped in having that open line of communication throughout the implementation of the project. Um, they had a senior project manager as well, so that part that person partnered with our day to day senior digital producer to run, um, you know, all of the status meetings, all of the, um, the updates on uh, where we were in progress with each of the sites and and the dam. So it was definitely helpful to have sort of two people running um, the day-to-day -day on both sides. And then there were a number of um, technologists on their side. So they had a technical architect who was the main lead um, from a technology standpoint, which was helpful to have somebody who really, um, you know, oversaw all of the different, um, you know, the 50 plus digital properties, as was mentioned in the beginning. Um, they had a number of different developers that were on the project throughout. Um, again, depending on sort of where we were, um, it was great to just have um, a, a different, uh, a full set of developers to help us. And then there was also some remote operations and, and management engineers on the project as well. So to move on a little bit to the to goals of the implementation, here on the slide, the, the two at the top, were sort of our main objectives, um, the multi-tenant environment and the AEM assets implementation. So first of all, the migrating over 50 digital properties to one environment, one platform, that was a huge key piece. Secondly, setting up a dam, setting up the digital asset management system, as I mentioned earlier, for archi archiving of graphics, uh, management of our artifacts, uh, those, those were the two main key pieces. And then two significant additional parts were to first establish a project-based 
automated workflow. As with most, most agencies, we have a robust approval process involving internal reviews, client reviews, legal, etc. So this was a really critical feature. Secondly, establishing customizable forms was significant in creating an efficient way to intake work requests from our clients. We receive a, con a consistent stream of work from, from the various brands. So that can be anything from a simple request for a logo to a multi-year brand strategy and marketing campaign. So those were, again, listed here, the, the sort of four main pieces as we uh, embarked on, on implementing this at the wonderful company. So um, at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Paul, and he's going to dive in a little bit more on some of the technical aspects. Thanks, Jason. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Paul Egan. I'm one of the managing partners at 3Share. Um, so to first talk a little bit about our approach on this project, as well as some of our general approach strategies um, when we work with new clients. Um, we started this project in much the same way that we start other projects, despite its magnitude. We tend to look for ways to bundle work into chunks so it can be completed in, in multiple streams. And, and we have a tendency at 3Share to, to build smaller, sort of more nimble teams rather than larger teams with, with more overhead. So with so many websites that required launch within a year, our development team really needed to work in parallel to minimize the risk. And part of that is to search for efficiencies through shared code and, and establish a migration plan up front. Um, in addition to that, we also needed to build something that the wonderful team could manage and take over themselves after we rolled off the project. Um, you heard Jason talk about multiple vendors prior to trying to replatform on, on AM. And I think it was a key component to making sure that this is something that's manageable after we leave. So uh, initially, we started down a path to give authors ultimate control over their content. And by that, I mean, we made literally everything customizable from an authoring perspective for some of these sites, including animation, the responsive content, pixel level positioning, and, and we set out to build a framework of shared front-end components for all of the sites. And, and while this was powerful, we realized um, you know, fairly early on that these components were not geared towards the average content author and required a uh, rather complex uh, skill set in order to produce the content necessary. So for example, we'd give authors the ability to specify parallax animations down to the pixel and animation speeds. And, you know, it was overkill, to be honest. And I think one of the features of, or one of the best qualities of 3Share is having an open and honest relationship with our clients. And Jason had pointed out to us that, you know, this was not the route we wanted to go down. And so we adjusted our strategy to work from extremely powerful user experience, uh, content authoring to more focused on the end user experience and striking that balance. And so we adjusted our workflow mid-project. Mid I think it was very, very helpful. So again, in working with Jason and his team, we realized that each brand had a different set of guidelines. So shared front-end code was less appropriate than shared back-end code. And th the shared back-end code would s save a lot of time, especially as we moved from the flagship websites like wonderful.com to smaller sites like goodvalleynews.com, which is more of a, a blog-like experience. So establishing that application architecture upfront, but being able to adjust it um, and, and, and adjust to feedback by, uh, by Wonderful allowed this project to be um, successful. So uh, we're going to start with a little discussion about the site's development, but I want to take a little bit of a step back first. Um, you know, while launching as many sites as this uh, as part of one project is difficult enough, uh, the Wonderful Agency has plenty of other responsibilities besides website implementation for their, bland, their, their brands and their clients. Uh, two other major responsibilities, I'd say, are, are content production and creative services for campaigns of all kinds, both digital and, uh, and offline. So this led to discussions with Jason and team on how to best manage not only the final assets produced by a team for create, uh, website builds, but also how to manage the entire creative process within AEM. So we started with a focus on AEM sites, which we'll talk about in a second. But that ultimately led to more strategic plans for how to manage work order submissions or requests for assets, and, and overall, how to manage the entire life cycle of an asset within AEM. 
So in short, um, websites always need fresh content and visual assets. Assets need to be created, but they're only created after there's a need for it and someone requests them. And once engaged, a creative person or an art director or someone in that particular group actually needs to find a place to share these and ideally has a large set of reusable artifacts at, at their disposal disposal in order to create new assets based on them and not reinvent, re reinvent the wheel. So we kind of move fluidly from a sites project to a workflow approval project to an asset organization project. But let's start with sites. I don't want to really get too far ahead of myself because I'll lose my train of thought. Um, as I mentioned, we need to find ways to work in parallel as a team to meet our launch date. So. Uh, we had our technical architect establish a plan for shared back-end code with feedback from the wonderful team. Uh, we would leave the front-end code as separate themes per site and, and stick to understanding what's common across all the sites. And there are some pretty, pretty obvious things that we wanted to get out of the way first. Uh, and these included uh, form management, imaging, and, um, and, and other authoring widgets that are applicable to almost every single component that we create within AEM. So this took the form of an actual imaging and tag library so that we could output images based on a given layout or device, uh, not unlike other adaptive image capabilities that we've come to expect in content management systems. Uh, then we took tedious tasks like, you know, rendering links out to the browser and authoring dialogues with the same fields and made these extendable so that you could, in your IDE of choice, um, as a developer, quickly create dialogues and reuse existing. And these aren't exactly the cool or sexy tasks that we wanted to spend time on anyway. These are just the essential parts of any site build. And finally, we took pretty great care to ensure that individual sets of components can be built separately um, and deployed separately using different development commands um, as part of our build process. So this meant that we could focus on core development at one, at one point and then have another person working on an individual site. Therefore, we reduce the risk that we're going to conflict upon deployment at any given time. And given the amount of sites that we need to develop in, in parallel, um, sometimes several sites per developer, we needed to minimize risk, especially during deployments. So once we got into a groove with a streamlined development approach, it became clear that we'd need to actually automate some of the content itself uh, in order to make our deadline. So it's great that we have a set of reusable components or reusable backend code and unique front end components, but if we don't have any content, then the sites would look pretty awful. So instead of turning to third party tools um, or hiring content authors to spend a weekend with pizza um, entering content, we decided to separate the structured separate out the, the structured content from the unstructured content. So things like blog posts and news articles and events, these things that can be easily mapped to a content structure within AEM, um, were great candidates for an automated migration plan. So there were sites like Good Valley News I mentioned before, which is a straight WordPress blog where we ended up creating Python scripts to parse the ex the export from WordPress and produce a series of monthly and yearly archives relatively relatively easily. And in our case, we, we took the approach of, of, of iterating fairly quick, quickly with these imports. So we'd import a section of content, figure out which properties we needed to fix or adjust or map to different components within AM, and then run it again. And the idea was that we could continuously run these scripts until we had a a, a perfect set of data. Um, so, so as I said, you know, once we had all of this structured content in place, it became easy to focus on more of the manual content offering of all the unstructured content. And since we identified a, a plan for both, we could do them in parallel. And Jason's team was kind of instrumental in, in, in that authoring side of things. Okay. So, before um, we, we start this small video that we have, um, I just wanted to kind of discuss one sort of, or introduce one sort of concept called the work order. At, at this point, we have a plan to build out all the sites from a project perspective, and we have a plan to automate all the content migration where applicable. But um, in partnership with Jason and his team, we kind of 
switched focus from from sites that we're building to sites that haven't been built yet and how we're going to maintain this platform after not only we leave, but after the original sites are in place, how we're going to enhance the sites once they're, um, once they've been created. So we talked about how Jason's team currently handles their, uh, work requests, the work requests. So if a brand has a desire for a new campaign or a new feature to, for a website, that information was managed sometimes even offline, pencil and paper, sometimes through email, and sometimes through external project man management tools. We kind of sat down and we tried to model this process so that we could utilize AEM's projects area to, again, facilitate the creation of assets and then the application of those assets to not only websites, but also offline campaigns. So um, I want to start the video. So we have a small clip here that basically shows this concept of a work order request. A work order is, um, at its simplest, the first step of the project creation process. It's, it's a, a wizard-driven request created by a brand who wants the help of the wonderful agency. So this could be uh, a new set of uh, photography for the uh, Fiji water bottle, any sort of any sort of request that would require the creation of some sort of deliverable. Now, these work orders can be templated. As you can see here, there are a lot of different fields that are out of the box available. Anything that's available within AEM can be used, but some of these fields can be dynamically populated based on templates. So let's say you're, you're, you're creating a, a work or request for something to do with the wonderful.com site. It's unlikely that you need to fill out all the same fields as you would for Teleflora or for Fiji. So these types of templates allow us to minimize the work that a, a brand would have to do when they're sending this work order. And as we're kind of going through, we are seeing that all of these different fields can be, I mentioned that they can be dynamic, but they can also control how the project itself is created once this work order is approved. So as we're seeing right now, a person is, is uploading probably some sort of guidelines for the request. Maybe they're visual guidelines, maybe they're something else, but um, you can attach all of that information to a particular work order. Once you've created the work order, you can submit it to a workflow so that it is received by a wonderful agency and then processed. There's generally a back and forth that has to go, uh, go on between maybe the legal department, maybe content producer to verify exactly what the request is and how it should be fulfilled. The approval process has finalized. The, the end result really is a project that's automatically populated within AEM. Next slide. So a work order itself is permission aware. So we've created our own console. If you see in the picture on the left-hand side, work orders is listed at the end. It's its own console that is basically an extension of the sites area. So we utilize all the same functionality as pages with an AEM. So if you're familiar with creating pages, you're likely familiar with how to, you know, the basics of creating a work order. Um, all the information is stored, again, as a special type of page with existing properties. And this, this again, this, the main difference between this area and sites is that you see all of the different methods and information presented to you are contextually aware. So you only see options to fulfill or create work orders in the work order area. That kind of makes sense. And because it extends the base page functionality, you can create any number of properties related to a work order and persist them, not only through the approval process, the back and forth with the wonderful agency, but also um, on the spawned AEM project once it has been approved. And, the, and as a user who's creating this, this work order request, you can not only create jobs, but also pick up jobs, or you can create associations between existing work orders, maybe based on a campaign ID or something, um, to show a, a larger picture of the work required to accomplish a particular goal or campaign. And then once a, a work order is created, uh, it's submitted again to workflow for review, and then we have the projects. Next slide. So here we see exactly what uh, sort of a, a close and personal view of one of the, the wizards, the screens in the wizard when you're creating a work order. Now this entire process, again, 
is something that is relies on not only the workflow engine but also um, the uh, projects area. Next slide. Okay. So I think we have another video here. It's a short one, um, but it it will I can kind of walk you through um, exactly exactly what a work order is once it's become a project. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the projects area of AEM, but at this point in the process, a work order has been accepted and approved by the agency, and it's making it, it's made its way into the projects area. So you see here that I am adding a workflow or a body of work, depending on what type of request has been submitted, um, we'd add a workflow or multiple workflows for multiple streams of work within the project. So once a workflow has been added, you'll see that there are tasks that have been created for individual users. And this, this task list um, is essentially a sequence of tasks that guide a project team to a particular deliverable. And at each task, at the task level, you can not only reassign it to different users, but you can also upload different assets, all of which are tracked as part of the global project and are persisted and tied back to the work order itself. So from an auditing perspective, any comments that are saved here, any uploads are all tied back um, to the original request. This is helpful if you do want to oh, later on, if Wonderful wants to track time associated with these tasks or integrate with a third party system, one of the existing third party systems that they already use to track time. But a lot of the functionality you're seeing here is built exclusively within the AEM projects area. And so not only can you kind of follow a, a project task by task sequentially, but you'll notice in the, if you remember in the existing work order, you can actually define which steps are necessary and which are not. So some requests may require legal approval, some may require um, senior executive approval, that sort of thing. So depending on what is selected in the original work order and approved, that kind of guides the steps that are presented to users as part of this project. So just a quick recap. Um, I've done a lot of talking, but so we now have brands requesting new assets for new campaigns, and we have a process in place to create those assets. So it kind of follows that we need a place to store these assets once they're uh, created. And ideally, you want this place to be relatively organized, and you want it to be relatively searchable. So we worked with the wonderful agency to create a branded asset share page for both internal and external, external users to browse and consume assets. Um, what you're looking at here is the branded experience. So it's based on essentially the branding guidelines of the wonderful company. And it can be tweaked, of course, by anyone, who, you know, a super user within um, the wonderful agency. But of course, this interface will show assets that are approved and are finalized for consumption. But there are also assets that uh, maybe are created as part of the work order process that are not accessible. Probably maybe they're either in progress or they're not to be used on an actual website or consumed by others. Next slide. So for these internal users, as you're probably all familiar with, AEM assets provides a fairly robust interface to tag each of these assets and provide filtering um, that ultimately makes its way to the branded asset share, but, also, but internal users can use this just as easily. Um, for mostly for creative suite users, the ability to integrate with their existing applications, Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, that sort of thing. Um, th that's really important to them. So we had that integration established, but we also made sure that the assets that they could, that are exposed within those interfaces are easy to search for. And if things are easier to find, users are generally less likely to recreate something that already exists. So I've kind of walked you through the entire project from the request to the creation, to the organization of assets. Um, so maybe I'll turn it over to Jason again to talk about some of the impact this had on the business. Jason? Great, thanks. So, yeah, so the transition into, into AM has not only been cost effective, as I started to allude to up front, but uh, it's really resulted in an increase in, in efficiency and productivity from, you know, certainly from an operations standpoint. And, um, you know, we've eliminated 
the need to work with third party vendors uh, on our properties, our sites, um, on, our, on our asset management. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, uh, you know, transitioning to, new, to the new platform has, has been seamless. As, as Paul mentioned, you know, the authoring capabilities, you know, they're, they're both robust, but also easy to use. And we're set up um, in a customized fashion so that we're able to manage uh, these 50 plus properties with a, you know, pretty small tech step. We've got a, we hired a couple developers. We already have our dedicated QA managers I mentioned. And, um, and my team, our, our producers, our digital producers um, can, can pitch in as needed if we um, you know, have some authoring updates or what have you. But again, those tools are really simple and straightforward. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, hosting costs and infrastructure was, were some key components that we wanted to eliminate. So um, you know, retiring servers, centralizing under one CMS, um, also, uh, you know, implementing the capabilities of the AM dam has allowed us to reduce our amount of active assets. I would say probably by, by more than half. I think we had, you know, something like, um, you know, 50 to 60 active terabytes of assets and we're down to, you know, less than 20. So, um, you know, we, we no longer need to continuously pay for server storage costs since AM, as many of you know, versions files. Um, on an incremental basis. And so you're know, eliminating duplicate and bloated files. That also has longer term benefits as we can streamline process. Uh, we can uh, consolidate tasks uh, and um, that just creates a number of efficiencies for us both in the short term and long term. And, you know, Paul was diving into a lot of the work order. Um, that particular part uh, has been really uh, successful right out of the gate because as he mentioned, we might get work requests uh, from a number of different sources. And a lot of it was, was paper-based. Our work order form was literally a, a Word document that, that folks would fill out, clients would fill out and, and submit into the agency. So mm -hmm. as you can imagine, that got very messy very quickly as we you know, are consistently intaking work orders uh, throughout you know, pretty much every day, um, but throughout the year. So centralizing all of that um, consolidating the multiple forms or the different platforms that, that we would intake that uh, it's it's been it's been really helpful to get all of our clients our business units um, and the agency onto one system so that not only are we are we receiving that information through the system but we're we're having that the conversations the back and forth questions the um, hey I'm missing a piece of information that can all be done through am instead of I got this thing through paper and now I'm going to talk to somebody over email or I have to go into a meeting. It's like we can all, we can all facilitate that through this one system. We have a number of uh, international properties and websites as well. And so um, through migrating all of the initial domestic sites, uh, 3Share was able to easily localize uh, sites for a number of our brands where we would maybe have sort of one templated site, one, one look and feel, and then we're able to easily migrate that and apply it as needed across our different uh, brands. So in this case, you know, Fiji has a number of, uh, of different sites out there in, in, in various countries. So as you can see, there's, you know, the language carries over any of the localization features um, but we're still able to to map it to the one one main site. Paul was talking a little bit earlier about this. Um, I think it's something that was really important from a logistical point of view, from an implementation point of view. Um, you know, initially, the approach um, that we discussed with three share was it was a templated approach. Um, you know, identify and determine how to create a core set of, of template standard components that we could uh, apply across multiple wonderful sites. Uh, and while that was um, while that was effective, after about maybe you know four or five six months into the process, we completed our first set of deployments. Uh, it was roughly I want to say 25% of our sites, and at that point, you know. 
Paul's team and our team, we sort of sat down and, and discussed it and said, you know, it's, it's probably better given sort of how our sites are set up, um, our needs of the end user, as Paul was mentioning earlier, um, all of those parameters, uh, it was better to take a more customized approach. So I think the, the point here is that it was really helpful that 3Share uh, was agile and able to pivot based on the needs of our business, um, even again, while we were kind of well into the project. Um, so, so again, you know, both of the approaches were fine, but being able to, to optimize on the fly um, was, was just helpful for, um, for our partnership with 3Share. And, and, you know, we were glad that they were, um, you know, willing to kind of talk through that even midstream. So at this point, I'll, um, I'll hand it back to Paul. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I mean, honestly, part of our, actually, the majority of our ability to pivot was related to your and your team's ability to work with us and partner to make sure that we knew exactly how these sites would be managed later on and how this, um, how, how each site would, you guys would like to manage it, not only from a development perspective, but also as an end user um, moving forward. So that was really helpful from, from our perspective. But perhaps our key takeaway um, as an organization is that you really need to be flexible when you approach a project with so many parallel deliverables. So Jason came to me, as he said, around the middle of the project, and we, we kind of reevaluated how we wanted to handle the end user experience versus the authoring experience to make it a more customized approach. Um, once we outlined that adjustment and we planned with both of our teams, uh, we moved forward with this renewed focus on, on really back-end usability and front-end specificity. And, and so part of that, you know, and as part of any replatform, once you've started down one path, the ability to adjust is, is incredibly important, but we should also consider different ways as we're moving forward to refactor or redesign or re-approach things that we took for granted or things we took as fact, as assumptions in the very beginning of the project. So that was one thing we definitely took away from this, and I think others can take away from a project like this. We also, we learned that it was helpful to target larger and, you know, the more flagship sites at, at the beginning of a project and to set, well, for multiple reasons, but really to set um, these sites as a reference for future development work. Um, more specifically, this was really handy as new developers can jump onto a project or off a project, either on our side or on the client side. And in the case of Wonderful Agency, as some AEM developers were hired, um, it was I think a good experience for them to have some standard sites to reflect back on and to use as reference for new development work. Um, finally, I, and I think it, this comes as no surprise to anyone, you, you really need to communicate what you're doing well and often. So in, in the beginning, Jason and team had mentioned that while we appear to be on schedule or we appear to be doing an okay job, we, we had, he had little in the way of, verifying our progress. How can he see at a very high level exactly where we are, given how many different tasks for how many different websites were in progress? So that high level view into the plan was critical, not only to keep our own focus, but for him to communicate to his management team with confidence that we were doing our jobs. So through some pretty incredible um, and persistent work by our senior project manager on the on the project, we we created spreadsheets of, of shared components along with the status um, by each site and even down to the feature of each site so that Jason could convey exactly where we were in the timeline. And I think that helped a lot. I think it helped our partnership and it also helped us, again, just from a development perspective, focus on exactly what was next and when something was next, how could that apply to maybe sites that were coming three months down the road? Yeah, I just want to chime in, Paul. I think that was a a really important part of uh, you know the project management side. You know, as my role as the lead product owner for the implementation, um, yeah, I, I was coordinating with our clients, with our executive management. Uh, you know, the communication, a style, if you will, at the wonderful company. It's very transparent. So, um, all you know, everybody from you know sort of our junior producers all the way up to our ownership are, are hands-on, they're involved in the project. So, 
it was critical that I was able to communicate, um, you know, whether it be just a status nugget or something a little bit more comprehensive to any particular audience um, of the stakeholders uh, that I was um, representing on the wonderful side to be able to relay information about the project from 3Share through to those stakeholders. So, uh, so working with 3Share to, to have that information at the ready, to have the right tools, those spreadsheets, et cetera, um, allowed me to do that a lot more effectively. Thanks, Jason. So um, before we go to questions, just a little bit about us. Uh, 3 share is well known for our expertise and client success with Adobe Experience Manager. Um, our services include consulting and remote operations management for AEM, and we serve clients throughout North America, Europe, and Latin America. 3Share uh, is an Adobe solution partner and member of the Publicis Group, where we earned Adobe's Global Digital Marketing Partner of the Year status for 2015 and 2016. And given our 100% focus on AEM, we're pretty confident that we can help you achieve success with the platform and beyond. Charmin, you want to take it away? Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Dennis and Jason and Paul for sharing that story with us. There are a few questions that have come in from the audience. And I'm going to um, just read them, and you guys can uh, jump in if you'd like to take it. So one here says, given all of the sites and channels that you had, can you describe your content review process? Yeah, this Jason, is Jason. I can, yeah, I can, I can jump in on that one. Um, yeah, so our review process, um, I guess the good thing is that we have a standard re review process across um, all of our brands, all of our business units. So um, that involves a few different layers internally at the agency. So our mid-level creatives, our creative executives, our president, um, you know, all of the content for the sites. Um, uh, if it's a different type of deliverable, for example, something on print or what have you, all of that gets reviewed through those filters. We then move on to, to the client. And so, so the brand would then review it and we'd go through usually a couple rounds with them. Um, again, that's, that's, content that's copy, that's imagery, look and feel, et cetera. Uh, we have a um, internal legal team. So our legal department reviews all that information as well. And then, like I said earlier, um, you know, transparent communication is really a key part of the culture, wonderful. So a lot of times our ownership will review content, will review, um, you know, maybe a, a a site redesign or a site launch or, um, you know, a key part of a site that's, um, that's being, uh, that's being produced. Uh, so, so it's a pretty robust process. Uh, earlier in the presentation, we were talking a little bit about the workflows. And so we actually, 3Share helped us to set up that standard, that, that automated workflow. So all of those steps that I mentioned are actually detailed in that, that work, that workflow, and there's actually more than I mentioned. There's there's some other other ones, but point there is that um, that sort of robust process is now automated through AM. And even you know, in some cases, sometimes you know, projects maybe differ. Maybe some projects are a lot more um, involved and may, might have a larger scope. So that workflow in AM, we can also add in um, ad hoc tasks or ad hoc steps or layers in the process if needed if we're having to sort of pivot on the fly, um, just you know, maybe based on um, business changes and business needs. So, so yeah, so that's a little bit about how the review process goes um, over here. Okay. Yeah, great. And um, Paul, given your part of the presentation, I think this one could be directed towards you. So can you elaborate on how does a work order differ from a project? Sure. Yeah, um, I, I can understand how it's a little confusing. So a work order is essentially a page within AEM that has all the information related to a request for a particular asset or project. So uh, a work order itself is created as a page, then it is submitted to a workflow, and then once approved, behind the scenes, programmatically, 
AEM automatically generates an AEM project based on that workflows information and pre-populated with all of the assets that were attached to that work order. So the work order, once approved, spawns a, work, a, a project within AEM. Hopefully that kind of explains the relationship. So you can always tie back information within a project to the original work order request. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Okay, that covers uh, the questions that we have had come in. Um, let's see if there's any that um, have come in lately. Um, we do have a couple. So this says, uh, was it hard to coordinate the QA efforts between your two teams? Who'd like to jump in on that one? I can, I can start. Um, this is Jason again. Uh, we actually had pretty, it was pretty smooth actually because our, our QA manager, um, he not only just for this project, but just in general, his role focuses on the front end functionality, uh, the front end capabilities, look and feel, et cetera. And um, on the three share side, um, their QA folks were more focused on the back end. You know, they, they of course did, um, you know, I think some, and Paul, you could probably elaborate a little bit more than me, but you know, some, some cursory front end, but I think because we had sort of two distinct work paths there, um, it allowed us for the most part to, um, you know, set that up sort of one after the other. We do the back end first, first and then hand it off to the front end. And then, um, you know, utilizing Jira for tickets and any sort of back and forth and regression to QA. So worked pretty smoothly. Um, it was actually helpful to have QA on both sides, I would also say, um, just again for, um, kind of cross validation and also for from a communication standpoint. So, Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything, but yeah, no, I I, I agree. Um, that's a great answer. I, I would say it's funny in the moment. Uh, Wonderful's QA manager definitely generated a lot of four letter words on our side, um, <laughs> but that really was amazing and it was really comprehensive and it allowed us to focus again our efforts on QAing the back end, the authoring experience. So. Between the two sides, I think when we met in the middle, it worked out really well. Super, I think we have one uh, time for one last question. This is directed towards the wonderful team. So it says, understanding all the efficiencies gained in centralizing on a single platform and implementing a dam, were there tangible business benefits also? So in related, for instance, to um, increased sales, customer satisfaction or retention, or getting ahead of the competition? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some of those we're still still looking at, so um, don't have any sort of hard data at this point. But um, certainly from just a satisfaction level, as I've you know I've I've done a lot of the training and a lot of the rollout with our clients, and so um, you know even just some anecdotal things from their standpoint is um, as I mentioned with for example the work order of, of not having to you know, have a paper form and having to sort of, you know, run that around to different people and, you know, have to discuss it in a meeting or a phone call or all these various kind of touch points. Um, there's definitely a, an excitement about being able to do it all through one platform. And, and we're still, you know, continuously implementing all of these different pieces too, as people get used to the interface, get used to using the software. But um, again, I'd say, um, you know, while we're still looking um, at, at some of the sort of, like I said, tangible um, business benefits. Uh, it's certainly from an internal perspective with our clients, uh, just creating a lot more of, uh, of a streamlined um, process from an operations standpoint. Great, thanks. Okay, I think uh, before we wrap up today, I do want to mention that for any of you listening in that's considering an AEM upgrade, especially with a recent release of 6.3, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or provide an assessment. You can get in touch with us anytime. I want to thank once again everyone who has attended and especially our speakers from well, the wonderful company, Dennis and Jason, as well as Paul on the 3Share team. Thanks so much, everyone. We're going to wrap up for today and have a great rest of your day.